Um, I thought I'd start out by asking you, Richard, um, your view, uh, which you call, as many others have, substance dualism. Could you offer just a, a brief description of what substance dualism is? And then also, why should an average uh, Christian layperson uh, be concerned with whether or not substance dualism is the uh, correct account of human nature? I think that all humans on earth have uh, consist of two parts, a body and a soul. And the soul is the part that thinks and feels and decides and uh, the body is the part that uh, uh, is in causal interaction with it and uh, uh, causes some, some of our feelings and uh, we, uh, we learn about the world through, through our eyes and ears and we act on the world through our, with our arms and legs. So the body is the vehicle through which we learn about the world um, and through which we act upon the world. But the real essential me is the soul. Uh, at death, uh, these two come apart. Um, the body decays eventually, and but the soul is still there. And uh, it's there, in my view, uh, uh, ready to be joined to a new body in the general resurrection, which God will bring us all to life. Um, in the meantime, uh, the normal Christian view has been that the soul continues and uh, humans continue to exist, but only with souls. Uh, the souls will be reunited to a, possibly the, the remains of the old body, but at any rate, uh, many other new parts to say so that it forms a new body in the general resurrection. That's all, almost always been the normal Christian view of the matter. Why does it matter? Well, uh, it matters, uh, firstly, because of the normal Christian view that we continue to exist after death uh, before any general resurrection. And uh, since our bodies are decayed and in the, in the ground, uh, it must be the soul, which uh, if we don't have a soul, we don't continue to exist. But more importantly, um, the soul is the vehicle of our identity, that is to say, uh, if, let's ask, what is it that makes a future person at the general resurrection me? Uh, well, he can't, that person can't have all my body, many bits of uh, uh, decay. At any rate, uh, even in life, uh, I have different, different bits all the time. New cells are re replace old cells. So um, what, what would make a future person me? And if you say, well, uh, it would be that the, the future, the person with the future body has certain memories and certain character, well, uh, there could be innumerable people with rather similar memories and rather similar character, but that wouldn't make them me. At any rate, uh, who knows how much of our memories of our past life we might have at the general resurrection. There's got to be something that makes a future person me. And uh, if the soul is the essential part and continues to exist, then the future person is me if, <laughs> if it has my soul, otherwise it isn't me. So the soul is the guarantee of a unique person after the resurrection being me. And uh, since life after death is important, uh, the soul is the guarantee of that life after death. So, for these reasons, it is very important that we hold this view. Tim, could you offer a brief uh, description of your view, uh, emergent individualism, and uh, as well, wh why should the average uh, Christian uh, be concerned that your view uh, is the correct view of the matter? Right. Well, let me start by saying uh, that I hold my views on this, as well as many other philosophical matters, rather tentatively. Um, it could well be true. Um, that uh, mind-body dualism is correct, that the soul is, the biblical language of the soul is properly understood to refer to an immaterial part of me um, that's uh, separable in principle from my body. Um, still, I, I tentatively incline towards uh, a different view on which uh, I am, uh, all of my parts are physical parts. I'm a biological organism but that uh, many of the capacities that we most associate uh, with ourselves as persons, our, our, our capacities of thought, action, desire, intention, 
and, and so forth. Uh, these capacities emerge from the body. They're not reducible to bodily processes, um, but they are caused and sustained, partially caused and sustained by um, our, uh, the, the proper functioning of our brains and nervous systems are, are required for these capacities to persist and to function properly. And so I call this the emergent individual's view. Uh, why is it important to hold this view? Uh, well, um, I, I think there's more than one view that a, a Christian lay person could be drawn to uh, that would be adequate both for theological purposes and uh, for purposes of integration with other things we know. But I, I prefer this view because I'm, I'm much drawn to uh, uh, Francis Bacon, the uh, uh, famous uh, thinker uh, of, of the early modern era who spoke of uh, God's two books, the book of his works of creation or of nature and the book of his word. And uh, both books, uh, through both books, we learn about ourselves and uh, important complementary truths. And uh, it seems to me that in recent years, especially since about the mid 20th century, um, we've uh, come to learn uh, increasingly a lot about one aspect of the Book of God's works, namely how our, our bodies function and specifically our brains and how they develop. And it, it seems uh, to me that a view on which human persons are fully embedded in the natural world uh, is, is it's going to be in, important to maintain, both when we look at the, uh, the biological history of the, the slow uh, emergence and development of increasingly sophisticated kinds of living things, uh, including ourselves, uh, much later in the game, and then also what we know about organismic individual development from embryonic state all the way to a fully matured human being. There's a gradual development in, a, in an increasing sophistication of mental function uh, that correlates very closely with the um, uh, development and uh, uh, the, the, the development of our brain and nervous system. And so a view on which new capacities are emerging as brain structure is developing in maturity seems to me to, to fit well with the information that we have. And so I, I think it's important as a Christian, and, and I'm sure Richard agrees, that we integrate what we, we think about human persons um, based on revealed truths with what we come to learn to varying degrees of confidence uh, from the study of the natural world, because certainly we, we do get information about persons um, and our natures uh, from scientific study of human beings. Uh, I have uh, no quarrel with the idea that uh, uh, soul and body are closely connected. Uh, indeed, I emphasize that our, our, power, our mental powers are sustained by, by our bodies and that we act through them. Uh, but uh, uh, my views on the soul are not derived uh, from, although they are of course compatible with, they are not derived from Christian doctrine, but there seem to me compelling uh, arguments uh, from purely secular knowledge in favor of this view. If you were to try and tell the whole history of the world, you would have to tell what happened to physical things. Uh, that is to say, tables and chairs and planets, uh, which are physical in the sense that everybody has equal access to them. We can eat, see as well as anybody else. There's a table there, uh, there's a planet out there in the sky, uh, and uh, we can each see as well as anybody else what is going on in my brain, at least if we tra take trouble to learn a little neuroscience. Um, it's a public piece of knowledge. I. Um, if you, you can find out what's going on in my brain, I can find out what's going on in my brain, and conversely. But when we come to thoughts and feelings and beliefs and desires and intentions, um, I, the, the subject, the person who has them, has privileged access to them. Uh, he or she knows better what they're thinking about, what they're intending. Um, you can, of course, make an inference from my behavior about what I'm trying to do. And maybe my, if you look at my brain, that will tell you a bit more. But then I could make that inference from my behavior and look at my brain. Uh, but I have a greater access to it because I'm actually doing the trying, and I know that. 
And therefore there are truths about the mental life which simply are not truths about, even though they may be caused by goings on in the brain. And given that, uh, all the same, even if you knew, even if by some mechanism or other, you knew uh, everything, not merely that was happening to my body and brain, but what thoughts were connected with that, there would be still an all-important truth that you wouldn't know. That is to say, who was having these thoughts? Because after all, uh, the world could in all public respects be the same, uh, uh, only uh, if I had your body and you had mine. And um, if I was having your thoughts connected with your body and you were having my thoughts connected with my body. So a full account of the world will not have merely have to describe bodies, physical things, and what physical properties they have, mass, size, shape, and so on. Also, it must describe the mental goings on, uh, the thoughts and feelings, but it would also need to add who was having these thoughts and feelings. The world could be different, as I say, in the respect that uh, you could have my body and I could have yours, but it could also be different in the respect that uh, a quite different person could own this body and I could never have existed, and yet not merely will all the public phenomena be the same, but the same thoughts and feelings would be going on. So a full story of the world has got to tell the history of persons, and merely supposing that's the history of bodies would have left something out. It would have left out who was having the body, who were having the thoughts and the feelings. And so there must be something extra and beyond, and that something is not merely the existence of a mental life, but the existence of someone who has a mental life. Um, uh, and um, uh, we can give it a name for the extra bit that's essential, call it a soul. But if you say there is no bit to me apart from my body, then it would follow that we would know all about the history of the world if we simply knew about the history of bodies and the feelings that were associated with them. But clearly we wouldn't, because you wouldn't know who was in control of the body. So inevitably, the very fact of, of human consciousness forces us to say we can only make sense of this in terms of a soul. And given that there's a soul, then it's a part of me, and it could continue to exist after death. Of course, I don't think you can give an argument of the philosophical kind to show that it does continue to our, uh, exist after death, but uh, I can give argument of a philosophical kind to show that it could, and uh, Revelation can make it clear to us that it does. But if the alternative doctrine were true, if the only things were physical things, then our bodies could be reduced um, not merely to bones in the grave, but could be turned into energy, so there would be nothing left to constitute us. And um, that, uh, seems to me, would rule out life after death. I'll just briefly um, uh, respond. Uh, uh, the difference between the view that I'm proposing and the, the more traditional view that, that Richard uh, very capably defends uh, is uh, in some respects a rather subtle one, and that's borne out by the fact that mu much of what he said, especially the, the opening part of his remarks, I, I fully agree with. That, that is, uh, I think our mental lives cannot be captured in purely physical terms. Uh, my conscious thoughts and feelings, intentions, goals, and so on uh, are, are aspects of me, properties I manifest, capacities that I have, that are not the simple resultant of uh, even complex neurophysiological uh, processes. Um, they are causally sustained by those processes, but they're distinct from those processes. Mm -hmm. so, so we agree on that. Uh, and then the question, the difference between our views is just where do those capacities reside? And I say they, they reside within the living organism. They are associated with the living organism. And so then that would, uh, Ri Richard says there's a further fact um, uh, th about who is, is owns the thoughts. That is, um, it's, he, he, he suggests that it's possible that I might have, things might have been so constructed um, that I might have controlled his body and he might have controlled mine. Um, but uh, that, I, that a supposition that that's so much as possible, I think, depends on presupposing the, the mind-body dualism 
that this alternative rejects. So if, if in fact, um, these capacities are capacities of this organism, and his psychological capacities are capacities of that organism, then that would not be a possibility, that there is not that further fact um, to be accounted for.